Okay, so today I want to <clears throat> continue where we left off last time and um, illustrate how a choice of contour can change the integral representation that we get for the solution of um, a differential equation. In particular, the differential equation that we're working with is the hypergeometric equation. <clears throat> so our learning goals for today will be to try and understand how contour choices um, affect the integral representation. Um, and in particular, this will lead us to um, kind of giving a definition of, or it will lead us to expanding on, on why we call the hypergeometric function a hypergeometric function. Um, and then finally, um, I'll say a little bit about the singularity structure of the hypergeometric function and how this will lead us to um, other um, known functions um, like the confluent hypergeometric function, which will play a role in the solution of the um, quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom. So let's start off then by doing an example. And the example I want to do is um, <clears throat> to revisit Um, the hypergeometric equation, in particular, the integral representation of the hypergeometric equation that we that we had. So this starts with the, the boundary term that we looked at. So let's start from the boundary term, which you will recall shows up when we do our integration by parts. And we note the following. The boundary term was what we were calling Q. And Q was a functional of K and V, the integral kernel, and its partner in the integration, both of which were functions of T. Um, and we don't actually need an equality sign. We just kind of need this thing to be proportional to. So the statement here is that this term was proportional to some t to the alpha minus gamma plus one, where alpha, beta, and gamma are the parameters of the hypergeometric equation, times t minus one to the gamma minus beta, times z minus t to the minus alpha Minus one. So this thing is really a function of t and z. Z, of course, is playing the role of the independent variable in our differential equation. So <clears throat> notice that this term vanishes at t. So this guy goes to zero. At t going to zero. Or let's say t equals zero and t equal to one, as long as um, the real part of alpha is bigger than the real part of gamma, both of which, sorry, uh, the real part of gamma minus one. Okay, so as long as that condition is true, as well as requiring that the real part of gamma be greater than the real part of beta, as long as these two conditions are met, then at t equals zero and t equals one, remember these were the endpoints of the integration, um, the boundary term vanishes. So let's assume that this is the case. And we're going to take a contour that starts at t equals 0 and ends at t equals 1. In which case, we get the following representation for a solution, which we'll call, let's say, w of z um, of the differential equation. And w of z is going to be some c tilde integral from 0 to 1. of z minus t to the minus alpha 
t to the alpha minus gamma, one minus t to gamma minus beta minus one, all integrated with respect to t. Okay. <clears throat> now what we do is we pull this factor of z out of the integral because the integral is taken with respect to t. And this gives us a c tilde times z to the minus alpha times an integral from zero to one of one minus t over z to the minus alpha, t to the alpha minus gamma, uh, one minus t to the gamma minus beta minus one um, integrated with respect to t. <clears throat> now we notice that what we have in here, this piece here, can be expanded in a binomial expansion. Of course, because we didn't actually say anything about the parameter alpha, so we don't know whether the parameter alpha is an integer, uh, half integer, or even an irrational number, and it's certainly allowed to be any of those, um, those things. I can't do a binomial expansion. I have to do a generalized binomial expansion, which you will have learned about um, already in third year um, in terms of the gamma function, which is a generalization of the factorial function, which allows me to extend the binomial um, expansion to non-integer powers of alpha. So when I do that, um, this tells me that Um, this W of Z must equal to C tilde Z to the minus alpha um, times a sum over N equals naught to infinity gamma of alpha plus N over gamma of alpha, gamma of alpha plus n minus alpha um, plus one, gamma of n plus one, times one over z to the n. And then of course I have my integral, which runs from zero to one with respect to t of t to the alpha plus n minus gamma all times one minus t to gamma minus beta minus one integrated with respect to t. <clears throat> and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change um, variables of integration. So let's make a note here. So in this thing, in this, yeah. Um, Let's say, I'll do it in yellow. So in this, I want to change variables of integration. So this becomes, if I change from t to one over t in the integral, changing, taking care to change the measure of the integration, etc. This becomes the integral from zero, sorry, from one to uh, infinity. So there's two things that's going on here. One is when I change from t to one over t, the one over zero becomes infinity. The one over one becomes one. That gives me a minus sign, and um, and I flip the integral. So that's why the integral goes from one to infinity rather. <clears throat> t to the minus alpha minus n minus one plus beta. Um, t minus one to the gamma minus beta minus one integrated with respect to t, which you should recognize as nothing but um, a representation for um, the Euler beta function, which is a ratio of gamma functions. So this is gamma of alpha plus n plus one minus gamma times gamma of gamma minus beta divided by 
gamma of alpha plus n plus one minus beta. Very good. So if we substitute this back into um, our expression for W of Z and cancel out gammas um, as appropriate and um, choose an appropriate um, expression for C tilde, So this is a choice. I want to choose this to be gamma of alpha plus one minus beta over gamma of gamma minus beta times gamma of alpha plus one minus gamma. <clears throat> then I finally get that W of Z, which I claim is, an, uh, is a linearly independent solution of the hypergeometric equation. And this looks like Z to the minus alpha <clears throat> times what I recognize as um, the hypergeometric function with parameters alpha, alpha minus gamma, plus one, alpha minus beta plus one with argument one over Z. And that's it. That's our linearly independent solution for The hypergeometric equation. And all we had to do to get this was make a different choice of contour, which dictated then um, <clears throat> a different um, parameterization of the, of the solution. <clears throat> Very good. Um, an important point that I had just left out um, in the example was that at some point, right at the end, I needed to make this identification with the sum of n equals zero to infinity of a bunch of gamma functions um, <clears throat> as the hypergeometric um, function. So this is the this is what is really a canonical expansion of the hypergeometric equation, uh, the hypergeometric function. In terms of gamma functions. And here, the statement is that the function 2F1 of alpha, beta, gamma, and Z, can be expanded as gamma of little gamma divided by gamma of alpha, gamma of beta times the sum from n equals naught to infinity <coughs> of gamma of alpha plus n, gamma of beta plus n divided by gamma of n plus one, gamma of gamma plus n times z to the n. So this important, this important expansion is the power series expression for the hypergeometric function. Now, just by staring at this, you can see that there's some, there's some relation, there has to be some relation between this expansion and the canonical expansion for a geometric series that you're familiar with, which is a power series expansion in N. So this goes like Z to the N, except there's all of these um, uh, gamma functions floating around. 
<clears throat> this, this particular expansion is called the hypergeometric series. And it's, an extent, it's a generalization of the geometric series. And it's a generalization in the following sense. If I pick a particular set of um, parameters um, for my um, hypergeometric function, um, then it reduces to a geometric series expansion. Let's do that. So the relation to the geometric series comes from choosing uh, alpha equals one and beta equal to gamma um, so that two F one of one, let's call it bulk beta, beta with respect to Z is gamma of beta over gamma of one gamma of beta times the sum n equals not to infinity gamma of one plus n gamma of beta plus n <clears throat> divided by gamma of n plus one gamma of beta plus n yeah, times z to the m. And you can see a bunch of cancellations take place here. In particular, this cancels with this, this cancels with this, this gamma of beta cancels with this one, this guy's equal to one. So this is nothing but the geometric series, which is some n equals naught to infinity of z to the n, which provided we're within our radius of convergence is nothing but one minus z to the minus one. So indeed, we have an expression for the, um, for the we have an expression for um, the standard function, one minus z to the minus one, one over one minus z in terms of um, the hypergeometric function. More generally, um, we can also write that 2F1 of alpha beta beta with z is equal to sum n equals naught to infinity, gamma of alpha plus k over gamma alpha, gamma k plus one, z to the k, which is one over one minus z, to the alpha. So this gives us an, uh, an expression for one over one minus z to the alpha, um, but uh, in terms of the hypergeometric function. And in fact, by, by tuning the parameters of the hypergeometric function, you can show that many of the elementary functions that occur in mathematics and physics can be expressed in terms of the hypergeometric function. As an exercise for you guys, I'd like you to show
that um, one, two F one, the hypergeometric function with parameters a half, a half, three halves, and Z squared is nothing but one over sine of Z. No, sorry, is nothing but, let's write it in a less ambiguous way. Arc sine Z over Z and two that two F one of one, one, two, the argument minus Z is just log of one plus Z. over z okay <clears throat> but you know even more importantly um, than than these elementary functions is the fact that the hypergeometric function encompasses almost all of the known non-elementary functions that you would encounter in mathematical physics these include um, amongst others the jacobi function the gegenbauer function the Jean functions um, and a whole host uh, more as interesting as these are, and as much as we'd like to spend some time talking about these um, uh, additional non-elementary functions, I'd like to focus on one of them. Um, and this is another function that's related to the hypergeometric function called the confluent hypergeometric function. And the reason I want to focus on this is because um, it makes a significant appearance um, in the hydrogen atom, which is the canonical problem studied in mathematical physics that teaches us a whole host about uh, a whole host of things about not only quantum mechanics, but also chaos um, um, and, uh, and a bunch of other things. So in some sense, the hydrogen atom is like the harmonic oscillator in, in how much it actually can teach us. Now, um, the way we get to the hypergeometric functions, the confluent hypergeometric function is actually through the hypergeometric function. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about um, now. To see how this works, let's recall that the hypergeometric equation as regular singular points where the coefficients of the highest order term, the z times one minus z vanishes. In other words, at z equals zero and z equals one. So this has regular singular points at z equals zero and one, okay? Now in physical problems um, involving a central potential, like where I would expect um, the, the uh, differential equation to show up as a reduction of the Schrodinger equation, um, so these are central potential problems like the hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom, for example. Only the origin where the potential source is located is a physical um, singular point, right? The other point at z equals one is not, a, is not a physical singularity. So to accommodate this, this fact that the z equals one point is not a physical singularity, what we need to do is hone in on the z equals zero point. And to do that, we need to push the point z equals um, one, um, we need to push the z equals one singularity out to infinity. Right. So the question then is, how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> so let's make a note of what it is we're saying here. So this is a physical singular, physically singular point. Yeah, let's put it on the top. This is a physical singularity.
but this is not. Okay, so to accommodate this fact, we're going to push the, <clears throat> so we need to push to push out z equals one out to infinity. And we can do this as follows. The first point is um, we can rescale Z um, to some new variable in our, diff in our ordinary differential equation. Um, so first uh, rescale z to, uh, let's call the new variable x, and x is going to be some scaling of z. I'm going to call the scaling parameter r. So I'm going to define a new variable x um, by multiplying it with r, and then sending r out to infinity. OK, let's see what happens if you do this. Well, if we do this, the following is true. Firstly, dw by dz becomes r dw by dx, essentially just through the chain rule, so that the second derivative, d2w by dz squared is just r squared d2w by dx squared so that the hypergeometric equation The hypergeometric equation becomes um, simply d2w by dx squared. And I'd like you to fill in the gaps in, in this derivation. It's not difficult, just takes a little bit of work. One minus gamma plus alpha plus beta over x minus r times dw by dx plus alpha beta over x times x minus r times w equal to zero, okay? So the deal was we rescale z to x and then we send r to infinity, the scaling variable, the scaling parameter to infinity. So what happens? Well, I've done the rescaling. I've seen what happens to the differential equation. Let's now send r to infinity. Well, if I do that, then it's easy to see that my differential equation becomes a differential equation for w prime or dw by dx. Um, which looks like w prime prime plus gamma over x w prime equals zero. But this is a very naive thing to do. And in fact, it seems to be that it's too naive. We get a rather trivial solution to this. So this equation is trivial. And if the equation is trivial, then the solutions we're going to get are going to be trivial as well. In order to get a non-trivial solution, what we need to do is be a little bit more sneaky with the way we take the r to infinity limit. And in fact, 
um, we're going to take it by simultaneously taking beta or alpha to infinity. And the question I have for you is, does it matter which of beta or alpha we send to infinity as well, right? And the answer is no, but I would like you to think about why it is no. The trick here is to first set beta equal to r, say, I mean, again, um, alpha and beta scale in the same way. And so it doesn't really matter which one I choose, but let's set beta equal to r before taking the r to infinity limit. In this case, I will find that my differential equation, the hypergeometric equation, becomes z d to w by d z squared. Um, sorry, I should be consistent with my notation. x d to w by dx squared. So this becomes d2w by dx squared plus gamma over x minus one dw by dx minus alpha over x times w equals zero. And in fact, if we multiply, if we multiply through by x, and then let's, for consistency's sake, call x uh, uh, z again. Um, then equivalently, we can write this as, um, or equivalently, we can write this as by relabeling. We can write this as by multiplying through by x and then relabeling. So I can write this as z d2w by dz squared, just because I want to put it in a similar, in as close a form to the hypergeometric equation as I can. Gamma minus z dw by dz minus alpha w equal to zero. And in this form, this equation is what's known as the confluent hypergeometric equation. So this is what's called the confluent hypergeometric equation. And it's called the confluent hypergeometric equation because the limit that we've taken essentially takes two of the singular points. So this equation has, the hypergeometric equation has three singular points. There's z equals zero and z equals one, which are regular singular points. And then z equals infinity um, is another singular point. And what we've done is we've kept the z equals zero singular point and we've taken the z equals one singular point and pushed it out to infinity. So we've made it confluent with the z equals infinity singular point. So we've taken these two singular points and we've conflated them, which is why this is called the confluent um, hypergeometric uh, um, equation. And the confluent hypergeometric equation has um, a, still has a regular singular point at z equals zero. And so we can make expansions about z equals zero. And the resulting solution of the confluent um, uh, hypergeometric equation is what's known as the confluent hypergeometric function. And it's denoted instead of 2f1, it's denoted by 1f1. And um, recall that we've rescaled one of the two parameters. So 
<coughs> it only has two parameters and one independent variable. So this is called confluent type of geometric equation. Um, and solutions are, so it's solved by the confluent hypergeometric function. confront type of geometric function is usually denoted by capital Phi. Again, test parameters alpha, gamma, and um, independent variable Z, or what is equivalently known as um, one F one of alpha, gamma, and Z. And this is the confluent, confluent hypergeometric function. Okay, so next time we'll pick up from here and we'll sh I'll show you how we can use this definition to get a series expansion for um, the confluent type of geometric function. Um, and we'll then show how the confluent type of geometric function emerges as a solution of the um, hydrogen atom problem.